Okay. So with these, uh, oh, let me spotlight my video too. All right. So these Monday, Wednesday classes are tricky for both of us because uh, we didn't talk about trig since Wednesday, right? So hopefully uh, you got my email about this and, and put in some work uh, outside of uh, outside of class, like a fair bit of work over the week, or really between Wednesday and today. Um, so with all that being said, what I'd like to do is get straight back into what we were what we were doing uh, without reviewing too much. But I will review this because this is very critical uh, idea. So we looked at last time special triangles with special angles, special triangles with sp special angles. And I'm not going to go through the construction of the triangles again. Uh, I'll just give them to you. So we had the 45, 45, 90. So a triangle with both angles at uh, 45 degrees. And we learned that the ratio of the sides can be represented here with a one, a one, and a square root of two. Of course, this can be scaled up, right? Like a three, a three, and a three square root of two or something like that. But this is the most basic one here. And then we had and by the way, there's the radian version of this too, right? Where the 45 degree angles are pi on fours. And then we had this triangle, a different construction, which we called a 30, 60, 90, because uh, this angle is a 60 degree angle. This angle then has to be a 30 degree angle. And this angle, of course, is the right angle here. <clears throat> so I can also orient this one this way if I wanted to with this side being 30 degrees. And the side, uh, the ratios, or rather the side lengths we learned were the shortest leg is one, the longer leg is square root of three, and that hypotenuse is two. And remember that these angles, 60 degree corresponds to pi on three, and 30 degree corresponds to pi on six. <clears throat> so these, these two are really the same triangle, just oriented differently. Okay, cool. So what we did with these is we found these uh, that with these special angles, we found that we can calculate things like sine of pi on four very quickly just by looking at a special triangle with that 45 degree angle, the pi on four angle, and remembering that sine is opposite over hypotenuse so opposite over hypotenuse, and we can quickly get to an exact answer for this angle. So the trig function takes in an angle and outputs a ratio of the sides of the triangle. In this case, the sine function takes in this angle, and it's a special angle, so it outputs a nice, clean, uh, exact answer here. Well, this is the exact form of it. And by the way, we tend to like to rationalize the denominator. If we have any where the uh, radical is in the denominator, we like to rationalize it. And just, just real quick, just in case you've forgotten what that is, that's I'm just multiplying by that root in the top and bottom. And that effectively, that's square root of two times square root of two, which is square root of four. Okay, so that's all that's happening there. It's just, just cleaning this up a little bit. It also allows us to talk about things like, uh, let's see, like tangent of 30 degrees here. <clears throat> tangent of 30 degrees would be looking at this triangle, looking at opposite over adjacent, because that's the tangent, the, the ratio of sides that tangent outputs is opposite over adjacent. So we're getting one over square root of three, another example of a fraction that we would like to rationalize. Okay. Cool, so these special angles, as soon as you can. <clears throat> oh, one second. Did you guys send me a chat? I don't see it. Uh, why isn't it here? 
One second, sorry. Someone's asking me if we have class today. One second. Mm. Or wait, did she get in? All right. OK, so anyway, so as soon as you can, just memorize these triangles so that if I ask you about any of the trig functions with any of these special angles, whether they're in radian form or degree form, you can just just spit out the answer because so much of what we do <clears throat> is going to come back to uh, these special angles here and the and the outputs that the trig functions give us for these special angles. OK, so what about other angles? I think maybe we already did this, but that's OK. What about other angles? Like, you know, 31 degrees, you know, it's just anything in between these special angles. We're just going to use the calculator. We're just going to use a calculator. That's it. OK, <clears throat> and also, I want to talk about the reciprocal identities and then we will uh, and then we'll do some practice using the calculator. Uh, but first, let me get this out of the way. So some reciprocal identities. I apologize for that garbage truck if you can hear it. It's literally come by during every single one of my classes. I don't know why I don't I don't know why it's come by three times today, but OK, reciprocal identities. Um, all this is is we have we have three other trig functions, namely the uh, secant theta is going to be equal to one over cosine theta. So it's just different representations of these original three trig functions, and they're called reciprocal identities because this is exactly what a reciprocal is, right? It's the multiplicative inverse. Oh, whoops. And then there's cotangent theta, which is one over tangent. So I'm pretty sure I've already written this down, but there it is again. <clears throat> so just three new three new functions and uh, three new functions and how they're related to sine, cosine, and tangent. All right. So now let's get into example three where I can ask you to actually calculate some angles using your calculator. So let's calculate, or let's say, let's say approximate, approximate each. So part A is tangent of 40 degrees, and let's say round to 10th place. All right. B is going to be cosine of 20 degrees. C will be cotangent of 14 degrees. Oh. And D will be cosecant of pi on 12 radians. So we're going to approximate each of these. So since they are not special angles, they're not a 30, 60, uh, 90, 45, anything like that, we are going to use the calculator. And that's why it says approximate. If it's asking you to approximate, that means use a calculator and round. OK, so what I would do is with my calculator here, which is one of these old school ones, this is this is what I use to get through my undergraduate math degree and my master's in math. Like I really don't think you need anything beyond this. Uh, but anyways, Oh, the first thing I'm going to do is say tangent of 40 degrees. My calculator is in radian mode right now. You definitely probably cannot see that, but it says RAD in the bottom. So I'm going to hit this button, make sure I'm in degree mode. That may be a different sequence of buttons on your calculator. And then I'll type tangent 40. I'm getting 0 0.839. So I'm going to write that as approximately 0 0.8. OK, similarly, cosine of 20 degrees is 
0.93, so I'll say approximately 0 0.9. Now, how do I find cotangent of 14 degrees? What I'll find first is tangent of 14 degrees. I'll find tangent of 14 degrees, which gives me that. One second, why am I? Yeah, that's fine, okay. Tangent of 14 degrees and then I'll invert it. So on my calculator, the little multiplicative inverse button is this X to the minus one. Oh, you definitely cannot see that, but it says X to the negative one. Uh, that's the multiplicative inverse. So that basically takes this 0.249, et cetera, and says one over that. And I'm getting 4.0, rounding to the 10th there for the cotangent. Now cosecant is the reciprocal of sine, and I also notice this angles in radian mode, so I want to go back to radians and type sine of pi divided by 12. Sine of pi divided by 12, I'll hit equals. Now I'll take the multiplicative inverse, in other words, the reciprocal, by hitting my little reciprocal button, and I'm getting 3.9. All right. Now remember that these are numbers, but they really represent the ratio of two sides of a triangle with, uh, for instance, in this one, if I drew a triangle with a 40 degree angle, so for part A, for instance, if I drew a triangle with a, you know, some, a right triangle, 40 degree angle, then the ratio of this side over this side, the opposite over adjacent, is approximately 0 0.8. Just re remember that's what's a tangent or a, a trig function. All of these trig functions are spitting out a ratio of two sides of a triangle. That's what's happening here. It's just that these are not common nice angles coming from our special triangles, so they don't get to have these nice like representations like square root of 2 over 2 or something like that. <clears throat> All right. Let's move on and apply um, these and our special angles to solving some triangles. Oh, the truck is finally gone, thank goodness. All right, example four. When, it's, when a problem tells you to solve a triangle, that means to find all of the missing sides. <clears throat> and uh, and angles, but usually the finding the missing angle will not be tough because they're going to be 90 degree. They're going to be right triangles, so typically that should be no problem. Plus, you'll have to be given both of the angles. The point is finding the sides. All right, so 45 degree. OK, so this is a special triangle, and I'll just go ahead and tell you this one is 45 too. I know you can figure that out. And then I tell you this side is a five. Okay. So I need to find this side A and this side B. How can I find these sides? How can I find these sides? Well, I know that I have trig functions that involve these sides given an angle, right? So I say I can say I know that sine of theta is equal to opposite over hypotenuse. And in fact, there are three input there are, there, there are three variables going on in this little equation here because sine is a function, right? So I've got an input of theta and then I've got an output of these two variables here or unknowns. I'll call them unknowns. So there are three unknowns here, but I know theta and I know the hypotenuse. This will allow me to solve for A. So I know that this will allow me to solve for that opposite side, which I called A here. So I can say that sine of 45 degrees is equal to a over five. To solve for a, I'll just scoot that five over five times sine of 45 degrees is a. A then, so sine of 45, I know from earlier, 
because I've already memorized all of them, right? Hopefully. Sine of 45 is square root of 2 over 2. So this is 5 times square root of 2 over 2. <clears throat> so I'll just say 5 square root of 2 over 2. Okay. Um, Okay, that's fine. Now, what about B? So that's finding A. So what about B? Well, B is the adjacent side to this 45 degree angle. So what trig function deals with the adjacent side? Well, cosine does, right? Well, tangent does too, but cosine is more appropriate here because the original side we were given is the hypotenuse and cosine involves the adjacent and the hypotenuse. So cosine of theta is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse. That's cosine of 45 degrees. In this case, this 45 degree angle is equal to B over five. So it's very similar. Five times cosine of 45 degrees is uh, B. Now, it just so happens that with a 45, 45, 90, the two legs are the same. So the cosine of 45 is going to yield the same thing that sine of 45 did. So I'm getting, I'm getting B is equal to 5 square root of 2 over 2 again. So with a 45, 45, 90, the legs are the same length. Now that's, I didn't draw a very, <coughs> excuse me, I didn't draw a very good picture here, did I? Because these should be the same length, but all pictures are not necessarily drawn to scale here. Okay, so any questions about that before I move on? I'm going quick, so I want to make sure I'm not leaving anyone behind with any pressing questions. Okay, let's do part B. Let's do part B, and let me do something else real quick. Okay, part B, here's the triangle that you need to solve right triangle, 60 degrees, and this side is three. Let's see, is there a question? Okay, so Brayden uh, asked, where did I get the square root of two over two in the last problem? Because <clears throat> I know that sine of 45 degrees, where did I do that? Sine of 45 yields square root of two over two. Remember pi on four is, pi on four is 45 degrees. So sine of 45 outputs square root of two over two. So that's how, and the sooner we all get comfortable with these, with these special angles and their outputs, the better, yeah, the better we'll all be. Yes, so sine of 45 is coming, uh, is, a, is a special angle. Yes, okay. Really, a lot of this is going to come back to these triangles. Okay. <clears throat> so let's see what we got here. We've got, we have an angle. So what do we have? Let's approach this differently. We have theta and the adjacent side. We need, we need the opposite side and the hypotenuse. So what we're going to want to do is we're, we're going to attack each of these individually. We need some trig function that involves theta and adjacent and opposite in order for us to find the opposite. So we need a trig function that takes in theta and spits out adjacent and opposite. And that's going to be the tangent theta is equal to opposite over adjacent. Now, is there more than one way to solve this? Yes, you can. Yes, there's more than one way. OK, so if you're thinking, oh, could you have done, you know, 
cosine and found the hypotenuse and then something. Yeah, there's there's always going to be more than one way. So tangent of 60 degrees. So again, this is a special uh, angle. But first, let me set this up opposite. Oh, I should name these. I'll call this A and this C kind of traditional ABC set up in a right triangle. So A for this leg, that's the opposite. And then adjacent is three. OK. All right, so now I know that I'm going to have three times tangent of 60 degrees is equal to A, just multiplying that three on both sides. So now here comes the special angle. So what I do, this is where this is what you should do when you're trying to remember, OK, what's tangent of 60 degrees? You draw your 60 degree triangle, that that classic one with the short side being one, the long side being square root of three and the hypotenuse being two. And then so this just has to be straight from memory, straight from memory. Then you say, OK, tangent is opposite over adjacent. That is square root of three over one. So in this triangle, tangent of 60 degrees, in this basic triangle, tangent of 60 degrees gives me a square root of three over one. That goes right there. Okay. <clears throat> so this is going to yield, I'm gonna flip it around, so A is on the left. A is three, that three times tangent of 60, which by the way is just square root of three, right? Don't need the one in the denominator. There we go, square root of three times, so I mean, I guess I could just say, I don't need that little dot for the multiplication. Just stick them together. Three squared to three. Now, last time I used another trig function to find that missing side, but here's another way you can do it. If you got two sides of a right triangle, like in this case, I have both legs, but in any case, if you have two sides, if you have a leg and a hypotenuse or two legs, you can find the other side just by the Pythagorean theorem. Marley said, would the problem be wrong if I just solved straight? Oh, you mean jumping straight from just straight to this? That's fine. That's fine. Uh, OK, so now what if I said, what if I said, wait, I have the two legs of the right triangle. So I'll use the Pythagorean theorem to find the hypotenuse. So I'll say A squared, so now I'm getting all mixed up with my A's and B's. Let me make sure, okay, so I called the opposite side A, three squared to three squared plus B, which is just three squared will be equal to that hypotenuse squared. Now, if you have already, if you're ignoring what I'm doing and just have said, I'm just gonna use, uh, what, you know, cosine or sine at this point to find that hypotenuse, you may have already done it, like you may already be done, but at least, you know, this is a, another way you can do it. By the way, what happens here when you square it with something like this, both of them get squared. In other words, this becomes a nine, and the square root of three squared is a three, so this turns into 27. Of course, three squared is just nine. Okay, that's gonna give me, uh, can I, speak? let's see, uh, that's uh, 36, oh. Is that right? Oh yeah, that would be right. So C is six, C is six. Real quick, if you solved it the other way, if you use the trig functions to solve it, and you said, I've got my um, adjacent side and I want the hypotenuse, that's gonna be cosine of theta. So another way. Another way to find the hypotenuse. I have that cosine of 60 degrees is equal to the adjacent side, which is three, over the hypotenuse. So I'm going to want to be careful here. It's the algebra is not going to work out the same, right? I'm not going to multiply the three on both sides. I have to multiply the C over and then divide by cosine of 60. In other words, I'm going to end up with C is equal to um, 
3 over cosine of 60 degrees. So just, just be careful with the algebra here. I think, <clears throat> yeah, so Marley, earlier your question, can you just jump straight to, you know, the setup? Yeah, the answer is yes, but just be careful, you know, stuff like this. You don't want to get too carried away and accidentally do three times cosine of 60 degrees in this particular little setup. Okay, so now, uh, so I've multiplied by C and then divided the cosine over. So now I'm going to have three times. Now, since I've already drawn my right triangle, the 30, 60, 90 over here, finding cosine of 60 should be just as easy as looking at this and saying adjacent over hypotenuse. So what I have is three times and what I'm going to write, well, let me say divided by 1 over 2, right, adjacent over hypotenuse, which, by the way, is just the same as 3 times 2. We're calling your fraction division rules. So, of course, we get the same 6. All right. Hopefully, some of this is coming together for you. Uh, I know I'm going quick. It's been like the theme of this class is me just like blitzing through all this stuff because we're, we started off um, pretty behind, but uh, remember you can always go back and watch these videos. Okay. <clears throat> By the way, one last note, if you are using your trig function to find, it, find one of the sides, whether it be a leg or a hypotenuse, and then you're going to use the Pythagorean theorem to find the other side. Just be aware that if you're looking for a leg, you need to make sure you set up the Pythagorean theorem appropriately so that your hypotenuse is on this side and just be careful of that algebra in between. Someone asked me that in uh, one of the homework problems, so I wanted to bring that up. Something else about the homework and asking questions uh, is WebAssign doesn't notify me if I get a question in there like it's supposed to forward to my email but it doesn't so and i don't open web assign every day typically so if you send me a problem um and you want like an immediate response like if you send a, a ask your teacher question in web assign the best thing to do would be to uh then email me and just say hey i sent you a question in web assign <clears throat> just because it doesn't forward to me all right example five let's do some more practice with these special uh, angles with the trig functions. Just some more practice. Sine of pi on 3 plus cosine of pi on 6. So all I'm asking is this problem, all it's doing is trying to force you to remember again the outputs that this trig function will give with this special angle and the outputs that this trig function gives with this special angle. The whole plus sign in between, it's just kind of like just the setup for it. You know, it's just the setting for this kind of question. At the end, we might do a little bit of fancy algebra to make our problem look nice. But the point is going to be in this first step where you have to remember what kind of triangle we're dealing with here. Pi on three is 60 degrees, so I'm going to need a 30, 60, 90. In fact, instead of 60 degrees here, I'll write pi on 3 since we're talking radians here. So that's supposed to be pi on 3. And I need to remember that the long leg is square root of 3, the short leg is 1, and the hypotenuse is 2. <clears throat> so sine, what's the second thing I need to remember? Sine takes in this angle and outputs opposite over, wait, yeah, sorry, opposite over hypotenuse. There it is. OK. Now cosine of pi on 6. Now pi on 6 is in this triangle, right? It's up there. But then we get into like, I mean, you can do it with the same triangle, but just, just for lecture's sake, I will draw the triangle just oriented. We, we like to tend uh, to, to have the angle we're considering right here in this position instead of up in the corner. But just know that you could use this triangle. OK, now cosine of pi on 6. All right, so if this is the pi on 6, that means the long side, the long side is now down here, the square root of 3. The opposite side is now the 1, and the 2, still the hypotenuse. 
So pi on six is here, cosine rather, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, so it actually ends up being the exact same thing as sine of pi on three. Okay. So if you take a triangle like this and you swap to the other angle, so now you're at the other side of the triangle, and then you swap the trig function from sine to cosine or cosine to sine, then you're going to end up with the same answer because you like swapped and then swapped back. So that's an interesting little thing happening there. And then I said we would do some fancy algebra here. Yeah, what's this is like x plus x, right? That's 2x. It's square root of 3 over 2 plus square root of 3 over 2. That's going to be two of those. So this equals 2 square root of 3 over 2, which is square root of 3. So this last step, that's just the algebra, right? Don't get too worried about that. That's just your algebra happening in between uh, to get to your nice little clean, compact answer here. The point is happening from here to here, drawing your little triangles and uh, figuring out what these trig functions are outputting. All right, part B is to evaluate sine of 45 degrees times cotangent of 60 degrees. OK, I'm going to draw each of the triangles we'll need here. Whoops. So this is my 45, 45, 90 with the side lengths of how did I say? Because we can do it with the. OK, one, one square root of two. All right. You might see this triangle, by the way, written with. <clears throat> written where it's scaled up so that this hypotenuse is also two and then both of the legs would be square root of two. If you look this up in other sources, you might see it written that way. And that's totally fine if you want to do that, because what that does for you is that means that you don't have to then uh, rationalize your denominator, right? You don't have to deal with that step. So you can, if you like, you can just jump straight to that and what the legs would be in that case is a square root of two, a square root of two, and a two. Just scaling it up by a square root of two, that's all that's happening. Okay. Now the 60 degree angle, shoot, sorry, let me draw it here. 60, 30, 60, 90 triangle, there it is. This is one square root of three and a two. Okay. So sine of 45, easy enough, is going to be uh, opposite over hypotenuse, which is 1 over square root of 2. So I'm using the classic setup here instead of the, not the blue numbers, just the opposite over hypotenuse there, 1 over square root of 2. Now cotangent, cotangent is 1 over tangent, right? If tangent is, so here we go, if tangent is opposite over adjacent and cotangent is supposed to be the reciprocal, the multiplicative inverse of tangent, then without having to deal with flipping it, finding tangent and flipping it, why don't we just go ahead and say, well, then cotangent is going to be adjacent over opposite. And that's totally fine. You can do that with all three of those reciprocal identities. If sine is opposite over hypotenuse, then cosecant is going to be hypotenuse over opposite. OK. So that means here I'm looking for adjacent over opposite for the cos uh, for the cotangent. Adjacent over opposite is one over. Yeah, yeah, one over square root of three, which is giving me one over square root of six. And then if I rationalize the denominator, uh, a square root of six over six. So I'm just rationalizing the denominator here, just multiplying by square root of six in the top and bottom. <clears throat> there is a chart in your homework, I believe, and in the textbook that outlines all the trig functions with all these special angles. That would be a good, make some flashcards of it. There's, you know, often in math, you're, I would, you're never going to hear me say, like, memorize this, right? Or you would think you would never hear a math instructor say, memorize it, because it's better to just understand it. But 
I'm just gonna be honest, memorizing these uh, outputs for these trig functions are gonna be, it's gonna be super useful to you. So you don't have to keep drawing those special triangles over and over again. Um, here it is on the bottom of page 449. So they've got they've got all six trig functions here and you notice some of them have little dashes through that's because they're undefined at that value that means like they're you're dividing by a zero that's why there's little dashes on those so notice tangent of theta it you can't see this but tangent of theta is undefined at 90 degrees but i think we'll talk more about that later <clears throat> in fact, in this next section here. So let's get into 5.3, which is trig functions of angles. Okay, well, what the heck does that mean? I mean, that's what we've been doing this entire time, or trig functions with, with angles. <clears throat> But what this really means is now we are moving beyond. We are moving beyond acute angles. Notice everything we've been dealing with so far, plugging these functions or uh, plugging these angles into the trig functions, has just been uh, angles smaller than 90 degrees, right? Angles smaller than 90 degrees, like 60 degrees, right? <clears throat> They've all been smaller than 90 degrees. So what we want to do is we want to expand to include all angles. And the really nice thing is for the special angles that are beyond the uh, beyond 90 degrees, we start to see repetition. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let, let me let's just take this one step at a time. So let's consider a point X, Y in the coordinate plane. So why am I bringing this up? Because what we're going to do is we're going to look at angles anywhere on the coordinate plane. But first we have to talk about how to get from moving around the coordinate plane via x, y to some angle theta. So everything we've been doing has been like just here. If we remember that angles start on the positive x axis and, and go counterclockwise, we've only been dealing with acute angles. So all the triangles I've been drawing, all these trig functions, we've just been living right here for now. But consider some generic point on the coordinate plane. So I'll I'll just put it here for now, x, y. Okay. <clears throat> so to get to this point x, y, when you learn how to graph points, you know that you count the horizontal distance this way. That's the x coordinate. And then the vertical distance is the y coordinate. So can't I say that we have a setup like this? where this horizontal distance from the origin to here is x and this distance from the origin up here is y right that's how you get around the coordinate plane via x y but can't i just kind of say well let me connect these let me connect these oh goodness let me connect these here and all of a sudden i've got a right triangle with some angle theta coming from the positive x-axis and I've got some hypotenuse, which I'll call R. OK. So what I'm saying is all the trig we've been doing with these right triangles, by the way, it is a right triangle. All these these trig things we've been doing with a right triangle can now be applied to. Uh, coordinate points on the plane. And what do I mean by that? Well, I mean that, for instance, that sine of theta is equal to the vertical distance of the point divided by that hypotenuse r, right? That's just the opposite over hypotenuse. And cosine of theta is equal to adjacent over the hypotenuse. And tangent of theta is equal to the opposite side over the adjacent side. In this case, 
So all I'm doing is I'm taking the context of what we were doing before with the right triangles, calling the sides opposite, adjacent, and hypotenuse. And now I'm just calling them the um, horizontal side X and the vertical side Y. That's all that's happening. So it's really just the same thing over again, just with different names. Okay. Why does that matter? Because I told you we're going to move beyond acute angles, but what the heck does this have to do with any of that? Well, because now we can consider points over here, because what this allows us to do when we say, well, look, you know, what we've just really been do dealing with is, is uh, it can be explained in the context of the coordinate plane, but the coordinate plane allows us to move outside of just the a right triangle right here, right? In the context of triangles, I can't move beyond 90 degrees, right? Because then it's not a triangle anymore. But taking the context, placing it on the coordinate plane, now all of a sudden we can go way beyond just 90 degrees, just this first quadrant. We can go all the way over here. We can have angles going into the second quadrant. We can have angles going into the third quadrant. We can even have giant angles going all the way into the fourth quadrant. And how are we going to figure out what the trig functions output in each of these with with bigger angles? Well, we're going to consider it just like this. We're going to be taking a point on the coordinate plane, somehow constructing a right triangle out of it, and it's going to be different in each. Well, it'll be similar, but uh, slightly different in each quadrant, the things that we're, we'll do. <clears throat> and then from there we can uh, we can figure out what our trig function will output for angles bigger than 90 degrees. OK. OK, let's see. Let's make a note here. Well, OK, that's fine. Let's note that trig function values are the same for two coordinate points. How do I want to word this? I put this in my notes. I feel like maybe this should have come up later. That's OK. Trig function values are the same for two coordinate points. I'm just going to say it this way, that lie along the same terminal side. So, well, terminal, terminal side. OK, <clears throat> what does that mean? Because coordinate points don't really have terminal sides, right? I'm talking about the angle at that coordinate point. So this, this is all I'm trying to say here. If I've got some, some point x, y, right? And then I can say, I can create my little right triangle out of it and say this is x and y, and this is theta. And then if I have another point up here, right, at x prime, y prime, just two coordinate points, but they're along the same angle. So this new one would be like x prime and y prime. Whoops. <clears throat> then the trig functions of this angle will output the same number. Because it's just it's just all it is is uh, there are two similar triangles and the ratios of the sides of a similar triangle are always going to be the same. OK, so this is a note. Sorry if that note confused you. I, I think I probably should have brought that up later. I'll bring it up again when it's more relevant. All right. Let's talk about. Let's talk about the signs that trig functions output. In each quadrant, remember quadrants of the coordinate plane. So 
So, so far, we've never seen a trig function output a negative. All right, I don't think we have yet. <clears throat> so have we seen, I don't think we have unless I gave a, a weird example up front, but so far we've been dealing with uh, angles that are all acute and we've just seen these outputs be positive. But what if we move beyond acute angles? So what if we were in quadrant two? So remember, this is quadrant one, this is quadrant two, three and four. Well, how could they output different signs? Well, remember that in quadrant one, everything is positive, X and Y are positive. In quadrant two, X is negative and Y is positive. Quadrant three, they're both negative. And in quadrant four, X is positive and Y is negative. So we have every combination coming there. So this means that if cosine of theta is equal to X over R, right, from earlier, the X, mm, the sine of the X, the sine of the X dictates the sign that cosine outputs, dictates the sign that cosine, huh, the, the sign that cosine outputs. <clears throat> because R will always be positive. R is always positive because it's a hypotenuse. It's like the, it's like a distance. So R is always positive. So where will cosine be positive? And where will cosine be negative? It will be positive where X is positive. Where is X positive? Quadrant one and quadrant four. Cosine of theta is positive, greater than zero, in quadrant one where X is positive and quadrant four. Okay. Now without rewriting the entire question, let me just say, or, or rather I gotta finish talking about cosine. Cosine of theta is negative where X is negative in quadrants two and three. So all this we're just setting up, we're setting up to be able to talk about bigger angles. And first we're just looking at how the signs of the uh, trig functions are gonna be changing as we scoot through each coordinate. And it's gonna be different for sine, right? When I say sine, I mean the trig function sine. Sine of theta, now, what dictates the sine of sine? <laughs> the sine of the trig function sine. Well, X controls the sine of cosine, and we know that Y is going to control the sine of the sine function. So sine of theta is gonna be positive where the Y values are positive in quadrant one and two. Oh, whoops. Quadrant one and two. Okay, and sine of theta is going to be negative in those lower quadrants, quadrants three and quadrant four. So the point is, is that cosine is controlled by the X and sine is controlled by the Y. Now, what about tangent? So any ideas about where tangent would be positive? I'll let you guys speak up if you, if you know. Where would tangent be positive? Tangent is controlled by both Y and X, right? <clears throat> so where would tangent be positive if it's Y over X? Looks like Marley is potentially about to give us an answer. Right, so tangent of theta would be positive in quadrant three because both y and x are negative, they cancel, right? Two negatives, if if tangent, the sine of tangent is controlled by y and x and they're both negative, then those two negatives cancel. 
but it'll also be positive in quadrant one because they're both positive there. So tangent of theta is positive in quadrant one and three, and it's negative in the other two, quadrant two and quadrant four. Okay. <clears throat> Here we go. Here's an example putting all this together. Example one. Or, okay. Example one. Which quadrant does theta lie in if sine of theta is positive and cosine of theta is negative? Sine of theta being positive means that we're somewhere up top in either one or two. And cosine of theta being negative tells us that we're on the left, either in two or three. What's the common one between the two I just described? One and two, two and three, it's got to be quadrant two. OK, so I'm going to allow you guys to think of any questions or if you're not sure about this, you want another example, then uh, you can speak up now and let me know. I'll give you a second to to think about it. OK. So we still have not started talking about angles bigger than an acute angle yet, not specifically. Yeah, good. Braden said to just. Yeah, we might be on delay. That's your message just came through for me, but yeah, quadrant two. <clears throat> um, so all we've done so far is just talk about the outputs, uh, the signs, right? The plus or minus from each trig function. Um, now let's start talking about actual bigger angles. So what we have to do for that is we have to talk about reference angles. So let's start our discussion of reference angles. <clears throat> okay. The whole point, the whole... Oh yeah, you're good. Okay, the whole idea for dealing with angles bigger than acute angles is that we are going to find that the special triangles that we built earlier and those special angles from the special triangles are actually going to work in every quadrant, but we also have to keep up with the sine of the trig function, which is what we just did with all that quadrant stuff. So in order, for me to talk about that, I need some I need some context. I need well, I need some uh, vocabulary really so that we're on the same page. So let me just get this definition down. So let theta be some angle. So any angle could be like 120 degrees. It could be whatever. The reference angle, which we'll call theta with a bar above it, is the acute angle okay i'm going to give you a picture after i write this definition formed by the terminal side of theta which remember means the the ending side of the angle but the acute angle formed by the terminal side but what about its initial side its initial side will be the x-axis OK, here's a few pictures. Okay. If theta is in, so I'm going to start with some angle theta. If theta is in quadrant one, the reference angle theta bar is the acute angle formed by the terminal side of theta and the x-axis. If they're in quadrant one, they are the same thing. So in quadrant one, 
theta is its own reference angle, its own reference angle. So that's a boring case. We already like we don't need to really talk about quadrant one anymore. We've already been dealing with acute angles, right? The interesting thing is when we get beyond quadrant one. So now let's talk about if theta is over here in quadrant two. <clears throat> the reference angle is the acute angle formed by the terminal side, so this side, and the x-axis. So it's if it's a, an acute angle, I need to go this way, right? It needs to be smaller than 90 degrees. That is going to be my reference angle there. That's what it looks like in quadrant two. So for instance, if theta was, say, in this case, 120 degrees, then theta bar is going to complete that straight angle and be 60 degrees. Quadrant three. Quadrant three means theta is all the way down here. Okay. The reference angle, theta bar, is the acute angle formed by the terminal side of theta, which is this line here, and the x-axis. So it's going to be this angle. That is my theta bar there. It should always go back to the x-axis. So you see in this one, it, when you're in quadrant two, theta bar kind of completes the like a whole 180, right? But this one steps back. So if I gave an example of an angle that's in this quadrant, so let's just pick an easy one. This is, let's say 240 degrees, then what would theta bar be? Theta bar is going to get you back to that 180. So theta bar here would, would be 60 degrees. If you're in quadrant two, you're saying 180 minus 120 degrees or whatever theta is. So we're saying in quadrant two, 180 minus theta gives you theta bar. Over here, we're saying in quadrant three, it's theta minus 180, right? It's like it, it, they act different in each quadrant. And remember, in quadrant one, they're just equal to each other, right? So if I'm, I could say theta equals theta bar. No need for any 180 or anything there. Now, the last one, of course, is quadrant four. <clears throat> I'll just draw it here. So if my angle goes all the way around here, theta, then the reference angle should drop from the terminal side to the x-axis. So for instance, here in quadrant four, uh, theta, if this is 270, all the way to the negative y-axis would be 270. So I'll go there. I'll just say theta is 330 degrees. Then theta bar is going to complete an entire revolution. In other words, it should be 30 degrees. And if you like to have the little formula there, then what you would say is an entire an entire revolution minus theta gives you theta bar. Different things. So okay, here's my advice to you. I would not try to memorize like four different formulas for for each quadrant here. I would just try to. Uh, be able to draw the angles. If you can get theta down on a picture, like a, you know, if I gave you theta equals 330 degrees and you can plop it down on a picture like this, like roughly where it is, and then draw the reference angle, then I believe your intuition in each case should guide you to finding the measure of that reference angle. Okay, that's the way I recommend solving these not trying to remember oh, in quadrant two is it 180 minus theta or is it theta minus 180 you know all that <clears throat> okay but if you like to memorize stuff you know then you could go about it that way all right example two is going to be finding reference angles oh by the way by the way what's the point what's the point of this Reference angles 
by definition, reference angles are all acute. This means if we tie everything from 5.2, so all of those special triangles and angles, you know, finding the output ratio, square root of 3 over 2, all that stuff. If we tie that stuff together, uh, tie everything from 5.2 with the um, signs of each trig function, so that's the quadrant, like in quadrant uh, two that, you know, cosine is negative and sine is positive, all that stuff, with the signs of each trig function. Okay, what am I, so let me make sure my grammar is correct here. Reference angles, or the, this means if we tie everything from 5.2 together with the signs of each trig function, we can find special we can find, uh, let me say, trig outputs, trig outputs for special angles beyond quadrant one, which is what we were stuck in without really knowing it. That's what we were stuck in in 5.2. So that's the point of reference angles. They get us back to acute angles. OK, so now let's do some practice finding reference angles because that's kind of like the machinery for, uh, you know, everything we're going to do. So, um, or well, it's in a really important part of it. So let's make sure we're all on the same page, page <clears throat> with finding reference angles. How are we doing on time? Can I... OK, so let's say A is 140 degrees. OK, so I'm going to go through these pretty quick, but what you're going to want to do for each of these, if you want to get ahead, is we're going to draw the angle. So I'll go ahead and give you B as, uh, I'm going to say, negative 280 degrees. OK, so I'm going to draw 140 degree angle because remember I told you I'm not going to memorize those formulas, right? I'm going to draw the angle 140 degrees is definitely somewhere over here. In quadrant two. And I know that my reference angle should complete the 180. So I know that theta bar then, which. Is the reference angle is going to be 40 degrees. OK, cool. Now, what about negative angles? Well, just see, this is again where we're getting into like a little bit of weirdness. Probably memorizing those formulas is not the best way to go. So, let me just fall back on drawing it. Negative 280 degrees is going clockwise. So, I know this is negative 90, negative, um, uh, negative 180. This would be negative 270. So, it's a little bit past right there. That is my negative 280 degree angle. <clears throat> Theta bar, the reference angle, should complete the rotation. So earlier I said, oh boy, I said something that's not totally correct, I suppose. If they're in quadrant one, I said they're equal. That's assuming that the given theta is positive, though. I should say that. So again, now we've got even more cases to consider just more examples of what drawing it is going to be better. So I know that here I'm saying that I, in order to find theta bar, I need to complete a whole revolution here. So if this is 280 and I want to complete a whole revolution, then theta bar should be should be 80 degrees in order to get me back around to 360. And it is it is positive. <clears throat> OK, let's try C which is 255 degrees. OK, speeding up a little bit. So I know this all the way here is 180. This is 180. This all the way down here is 270. So I know I'm like down here somewhere. I'm not going to worry about exactly where. So I know in order to get my reference angle, it needs to go from the terminal side back to the x-axis. 
So what I'm going to end up doing is I'm thinking, OK, I've got 255, but that passes my reference angle. I want to get from the 255 back to this 180 here, right? So I'm going to do 255 uh, minus 180. 255 minus 180. <coughs> Excuse me. OK, which is uh, sorry, got distracted at 75 degrees. OK, 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 let's keep going with D, which is 20 degrees. Ah, nice positive angle that's in quadrant one. Theta bar is just 20 degrees. Nice. OK. I've got a lot of these. Let's do some radians now. E is 3 pi over 4. So everything I was giving before was in terms of degrees, but we should probably just remember that pi is 180 degrees and 2 pi is 360. That's probably going to be helpful to remember here. <clears throat> 3 pi on 4, let's draw it. So 3 pi on 4, I got to remember pi on 4 is 45 degrees. So 45, then another one puts me here. That would be straight up and down would be 2 pi on 4, and then one more. There's my 3 pi on 4 angle. I want to complete the revolution, right? I want to complete from terminal side to x axis. So, does anyone have any guesses about what pi, or sorry, what theta would be? What would theta be? Um, let's see. Bailey, any ideas what theta would be here? Or rather, theta bar, the reference angle. Oh, oh, wait, we have a chat. Let's see what they said. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so, th so theta, 3 pi on 4, it may help to, to note that yeah, sorry, I meant theta bar earlier. Just let's note that 3 pi on 4 is 135 degrees because it's three of those 45 degree angles. But I'm going to want theta bar in terms of in radians. If my theta is given in radians, then the theta bar needs to be in radians. So I need to complete this straight angle, but I know straight angle is, is pi. So what do I need to add to 3 pi on 4 to make it pi? I just need to give it another quarter, right? Pi on four, pi on four. Good. Okay, I'll give you all another one to try. Oh, I didn't write the angle. Uh, seven pi on six, seven pi on six. <clears throat> okay, where would that end up? So this is going to be a good exercise, just drawing these angles, right, when they're in radian form. So something to keep in mind when you're drawing these, when you're drawing these, is that 7 pi on 6 is the same as a whole angle pi plus a little pi on 6, right? Seven pi, Just fraction stuff, right? That's pi on, uh, 6 pi on 6 plus an extra one, which 6 pi on 6 is just a whole pi, right? But that's an entire straight angle, 180 degrees, plus a pi on 6 is 30 degrees. So if it helps you to get it back in degree form in order to be able to draw the original theta, then that, you know, then that's fine. Do that if you if you need to. The sooner we can all get on board with going just like if I say 11 pi on six and you just immediately can picture it, like that would be great because it would make this entire class just so much easier for you. So the sooner you can uh, come to terms with how to get from a radian measure like this onto a picture, the better. Okay, so here we go. There's my seven pi on six angle, 30 degrees past the straight angle. By the way, what would the reference angle be then in terms of pi does anyone want to venture a guess in terms of pi so not not degrees i'm asking for the pi over something 
It would be the pi over six, right? That's right. That's it. Pi over six. That little extra piece. Pi on six. Good. Okay. <clears throat> All right. The last two I'm going to leave for you to do as exercises so we can move on to something else. This one is five pi on three. And you can totally ask me about this via email or in next class meeting, but here they are. G is five pi on three. H is a negative radian, so that would be a good negative five pi over six. Now, let's put it all together and find the exact value of trig functions that are beyond the first quadrant. So like I said earlier, we're going to put them together, put all this reference angle stuff together with the signs of the trig, the output of the trig functions. Okay, cosine of 240 degrees. Step one, we're going to draw the angle. And we're going to find its reference angle. OK, 240 degrees. I know that's. Uh, um, this is 180 all the way across here is 180, so I'm going to go 60 degrees past 180, so it's putting me down here somewhere. That means my reference angle. Well, I kind of already said it right. It's. 60 degrees past that 180, so my reference angle there is, is uh, 60 degrees. OK. But I want to find the cosine of that, right? I found my reference angle and whatever, but I said that, you know, this gets us back to acute angles, which there it is. There's my acute angle. But how do I get this back to triangles? Well, I know that if I draw a right triangle, from this picture. So if I drop a perpendicular line from my angle here, so I draw my right triangle sort of oriented the same way here, by saying what the reference angle is, I can pull this right triangle out and say, look, it's a 60, it's a 30, 60, 90, right? It's, it's a 30, 60, 90, where if I recall in the 30, 60, 90, this side is one, this side is square root of three, and this side is two. Oh, I'm sorry if, you're, if your screen froze. Let me see. Okay, mine is still good, which means it's your Wi-Fi, which that sucks, but um, you can always, this is being recorded, so you can always go back and, and view it later. <clears throat> but I have to press on here. Okay, so what happens here is once I get this picture drawn and I've drawn my reference angle, I can pull out a reference triangle. And now I can figure out what cosine of 240 is because I can just say, oh, well, it should be adjacent, oops, adjacent over hypotenuse. Is adjacent there's this adjacent to the 60 degree angle over hypotenuse but i also need to remember that cosine of theta is negative because it's controlled by the x it's negative in quadrant three where x is negative so my output here is negative one half All of those ratios, okay, all of those ratios that we had before, if you've looked at that table, the square root of three over two, square root of two over two, one over two, square root of three over one, one over square root of three, all of those weird ratios, those not, well, I should say the nice ratios we get from nice angles are gonna come back around as long as that reference angle also becomes a nice angle, a nice acute angle, like a 30, 60, or 45. And all you have to do once you draw your reference, tri uh, reference triangle is set up your trig function like you normally would, adjacent over hypotenuse, and then just slap a negative sign on it if it needs it. 
OK, and by the way, you could also ask your calculator for this one since it is a nice angle. You can't ask your calculator all the time because. Uh, a lot of times the answers are like square root stuff, so you won't exactly recognize it. But if I said cosine of 240, it's going to give me. If you can see it, negative 0 0.5. OK, but yeah, don't think that you can rely on the calculator all the time. In fact, most of the time you cannot because your answer will be like square root of 3 over 2, and that's going to be a weird decimal number. OK. Let's do sine of 3 pi on 4. So this is going to be a long example. I've got like all the way out to J. So we'll see if we can just get through as many as we can. OK, so I draw the angle first. I'll draw it over here. 3 pi on 4, we actually drew it earlier, but I'll just remind you, pi on 4 is 45. 2 pi on 4 would be 90. So 3 pi on 4 would be over here which is 135 degrees, but I'll call it 3 pi on 4. So that reference angle coming down here will be pi on 4. <clears throat> now I'm going to drop a perpendicular line that uh, so, so that this angle here, my reference angle is, is inside my reference triangle. I'm going to pull that out, orienting it the same way. Whoa, that's ugly. Oh, goodness. Let me just retry that. OK, there's my pi on four right there. That's that what I drew as a red angle over here. And then I recognize this as a reference triangle. Uh, with sides 1, 1, and square root of 2. Now I'm going to say, is sine positive or negative here? Sine of theta is positive, positive in quadrant 2, right, which is where we are, quadrant 2. So sine of 3 pi on 4 is equal to opposite over hypotenuse, which is 1 over square root of 2, and just rationalizing the denominator gives me square root of 2 over 2, which is the exact same as sine of pi on 4, right? So that's kind of the point here is that as long as with the, you, you get the reference angle out of the bigger angle, you pull the triangle out, just make note of the sign of whatever your trig function is, and then you just treat it basically like those original angles we, we already learned about. So it's all coming back to those original special angles. <clears throat> all right. I'm going to take a little bit of a detour here because I realize I should, before I get any further, I should really talk about some other special angles that we haven't noticed yet, which are the um, the right angle, the straight angle, and the, uh, the 270 degrees. So let's consider the special angles. Zero degrees, 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 270 and then back to 360. In other words, zero radians, pi on 2, pi, 3 pi on 2, and 2 pi. So just the radian version of each of these angles. So can't really draw a triangle with these, right? Because, uh, well, you can't. You can't draw a right triangle with like two 90 degree angles or something like that, right? So triangles will not help us here. Instead, what will help us is remembering that sine of theta is equal to um, y over the radius r, whatever that is. And cosine of theta is adjacent x over hypotenuse <clears throat> and tangent of theta is y over x. OK, well, why is that helpful? Why is that helpful? Because what I'm going to do for each of these angles is 
write their corresponding coordinate points. What do I mean by that? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, consider a zero degree angle, which is just doesn't go anywhere, right? It's flat right there. <clears throat> Let's consider it as a point where X is one and Y is zero. No problem with that, right? And let's consider a point up here at a 90 degree angle where X is zero and Y is one. So we're just looking at these special spots on the coordinate axes where they're all out at a distance of one, but they're on the axis or on the axes. Positive X axis, positive Y axis over here, negative X axis, so negative one comma zero. And then down here, negative Y axis, zero comma negative one. <clears throat> OK, this corresponds to a zero degree angle, a 90 degree angle, all the way across a 180 degree angle, all the way down here, whoops, all the way down here is a 270, and all the way around is 360. So cosine of zero degrees, what would that be? And remember that R here, all of the R's is just going to be one because it's like a distance. So R is one. So cosine should be the X over one, but X is one, so it's just one. Okay, one over one. What about sine of zero degrees? Well, sine should be the Y value over R, which is just one here. So let me just say, just for note, R is equal to one everywhere here. That's why I picked these coordinate points at a distance of one, because all the distances here will just be one. This just makes things easier. So sine of zero degrees should be that Y value, but that's zero. So that's just zero. So these are the special, I guess the most special angles, because they are gonna contribute to these extreme values for our trig functions. Later we'll talk about the ranges of these trig functions, and we're seeing that these are gonna be like the highest and lowest that uh, sine, cosine, and tangent can, well, sine and cosine can give us. So let's consider moving along here, cosine of 90 degrees. It should be the X value over one, but the X value here is zero, so that's zero. What about sine of 90 degrees? It should be the Y value over one, but the Y value is one, so that's one. This is all in that chart too, by the way. Now, what about tangent of zero degrees? Tangent of zero degrees, we don't have to consider R, it's supposed to be Y over X. Zero over one is zero. What about tangent at 90 degrees? Tangent at 90 degrees is still Y over X, but it's one over zero, that's undefined. So remember I told you in that table, some of those spots are gonna have little dashes for undefined. This is one of those examples, whenever you're dividing by that zero. So I don't wanna complete the rest of this, but you can, you can complete the rest of this or just look at that chart on whatever the page was uh, in the textbook. But basically you're just gonna see zeros, ones and negative ones and sometimes undefined for the tangent function. For, for all of these angles. Okay, so that's just a little uh, detour there. Wanted to make sure I talked about these angles in particular. <clears throat> so we were on number C, or letter C, I believe. Yeah, it's from example three. Oop. So back to example three, number C is cosine of seven pi on six. Might be the last one we have time for here. So cosine of seven pi on six, so I'm gonna draw the seven pi on six. So we kind of, well, we already drew this one, it's all the way down here. And I know my reference angle, theta bar is gonna be pi on six. So my triangle, when I pull out the triangle, it's hypotenuse is here and it's, hypotenuse is here. This angle is a pi on six, so it's a 30, 60, 90, but that's the smaller angle, 30. So that means that's one, that's a three, a square root of three, and that's a two. 
There's my little pi on six. That's my little reference angle. I also need to note that cosine theta is negative in quadrant three, which is where we are, quadrant three. And so I'm going to say that cosine of seven pi on six, according to my little triangle, is adjacent over hypotenuse, but it's negative. So extending beyond the quadrant one is really as simple as finding the reference angle, draw, uh, pulling out a reference triangle, you have to remember that, right? Writing down the ratio of the sides as you normally would from what we were doing earlier. And then last thing, just recalling which, uh, or rather what the sign will be on your output given the trig function and, and, and where you are in the coordinate plane. <clears throat> I'm going to give you some more to try on your own, and we will talk about them. Let me make a mark here where we stopped. But I at least want to give you a few to try on your own. If Secant of five pi on four. So some co functions coming in, uh, coming here. And what if you have a giant angle like that? Yeah. And sine of pi on two, which I kind of already gave away there. So there is seven more for you to try. If you can get through these, then you are looking good for, for this uh, up to this point in this class. If you can get through these um, without consulting your notes to remember what the triangles look like, if you can get through these without notes, then you are looking real good. Um, all right, next time I'm gonna talk about a new identity that relates the sine and cosine functions. You can probably already tell they're pretty related, but we're gonna have a new identity that relates them. And then we'll talk a little bit more about finding missing sides on triangles and then we'll move into the next section which is inverse trig functions so you guys are good to go i'll see you on wednesday